Hi, and welcome to Why Do Countries Exist, Episode 29, Burkina Faso. So today's drink of choice is Zoom Kum. Zoom Kum, besides being a fun thing to say, is also a drink popular in Burkina Faso and parts of Western Africa, being made from millet flour, chili powder, sugar, ginger, pineapple, and tamarind. You mix all that together and you get Zoom Kum, which is a pretty good drink, I think. <laughs> At first I thought it was kind of weird, but I had more of it and it's got an interesting flavor. The ginger and the chili make it slightly spicy, which was good. Overall, I feel like it was a pretty good drink, uh, but I'm not sure if I would try it again. But I enjoyed it. It also is apparently traditionally used as a drink you give when someone enters your house. This welcoming drink will welcome us, see what I did there, to West Africa, where Burkina Faso is located. It has Mali to the northwest, Niger to the northeast, and Benin, Togo, Ghana, and the Ivory Coast to the south. Climate-wise, the country is divided into three main zones. The northeast is fairly desert-like and is very hot. The south, meanwhile, is more of a tropical savanna and tends to be a bit wetter. Finally, right in the middle, there is an intermediary zone, which is categorized by being hot, mostly flat, and having red soil. This intermediary zone is also where the majority of the population is, with a little over 21 million people living in the country. The majority of people belong to the Mosi ethnic group, with a little over 50% of the population being Mosi, and tend to be found in the center of the country and in the capital, Ouagadougou. While the Mosi tend to dominate, they are not the only group. There are the Fulani found throughout the country, who make up 9.4%, the Bobo found in and around the city of Bobo de la Sol, and make up 6%, and the Gurma, who make up almost 6% and are found in the east. There's a lot more ethnic groups found throughout the country, but I figure touching up on the groups with over 5% would probably be a good starting point. The remaining groups are usually, of course, Africans, but there are a small number of white and Arabic Burkinabe. Language-wise, the country is again very diverse, but a majority will speak Mosi, which is a language in the Niger-Congo language family, making it roughly similar to other languages spoken in the country. There is Fula, which is commonly used as a lingua franca, especially in the north. There also is French, which is the official language and is used in politics, schooling, and the press, but tends to be fairly uncommon in everyday life. Finally, religion-wise, it's a fairly complicated story. Similar to when I talked about religion in the Benin episode, a lot of people have a sort of mixed religion, taking parts of Islam and or Christianity and mixing it with traditional folk beliefs. I've heard various different demographic numbers for this, some saying that over 90% of the country are syncretic, mixing all of these beliefs together, while Orthodox Muslims, Christians, and even animalists are composing less than 10% of the population. I have also heard at the same time that a majority of the country is Sunni Muslim, with a large Christian minority and a smaller but still large animalist community. Generally, it seems Islam holds most sway in the border regions of the country, while the center and the south is more Christian. So now let's get to the history of Burkina Faso. There have been humans living in the country for hundreds of thousands of years, and in that time many cultures and people existed throughout the country. Many existed in and around the four major rivers in the country. The Niger River, which was located mostly in neighboring Niger, of course. Then there was the Black Volta, the Red Volta, and the White Volta. Iron production began near several of these rivers. Starting in the 12th century, Burkina Faso began to experience an influx of people entering the country, fleeing violence, drought, and disease from wherever they were from. Most notable of these would be the Mosi people, who moved north from Ghana. The Mosi set up a series of kingdoms in central and southern Burkina Faso, and were noted for their powerful cavalry, that was successfully able to take on and defeat at several points the large Malian empires in the north. They were also noted for allowing their defeated and conquered enemies some semblance of respect, not attempting to assimilate or forcing them to adhere to Mosi customs. The kingdom of Ouagadougou seems to have been the most powerful, with its king, the Moral Naba, having a sort of limited authority over all the other Mosi kingdoms. This authority, I should emphasize, was very limited, with most Mosi kingdoms essentially independent from Ogadugu. I suspect a good comparison might be the Holy Roman Empire, where, yeah, the Holy Roman Emperor has some sort of authority over his various vassals, but a lot of the time, the Emperor's vassals are de facto independent. 
Actually today, the Moro Nava exists still, and continues to serve as an important figure in Burkinabe politics. In the late 19th century, Europeans began encroaching deeper and deeper into Africa. The French began taking parts of Burkina Faso in the 1890s, and by 1901 Burkina Faso was firmly under French colonial hands. The colony was used both as a location to transport troops from the coast into some of the more interior areas, such as Mali or Niger, and limited resource extraction also began, with cotton and gold becoming the main exports out of the colony, and still to this day are some of the main economic industries in the country. French colonial policy in Africa was characterized by its civilizing mission. It sought to convert the native Africans, which they saw as barbaric and savage, towards European and specifically French cultural norms, attitudes, and ideas. It sought to spread Catholicism, the French language, and French laws throughout its colonies. While in most French colonies, French rule would often see very little autonomy on the local level, Burkinabe elites seemed to a certain extent keep some of their autonomy. These elites would work under French colonial administrators, helping ensure that their people remained okay with the status quo. However, not all in the country accepted the new status quo. During World War I, Burkina Faso was expected, like many areas of French Africa, to provide men for the war effort against Germany, and taxes were increased. This increased pressure in the region, along with already existing frustration towards French colonial government, started the Volta Bani War in 1915. While the revolt would be put down two years later in 1917, it would importantly encourage the French to reorganize its colonies in West Africa. In 1919, they created the colony of Upper Volta, which corresponds to the modern-day state of Burkina Faso, and will be the name of the country for the next roughly 70 years. World War II would similarly see men from across French Africa serve to fight for the French army. When many of these veterans returned home at war's end, they, being told throughout the war that they were fighting for democracy against the rising tide of fascism, decided to try and fight for democracy back home. New political parties were formed demanding greater autonomy and rights to the Africans on the continent. France, suffering with colonial wars in Algeria and Vietnam, internal unrest in France itself, an economy still trying to pull itself together post-World War II, and seeing anti-colonial movements spring up in almost all of its colonies, began giving greater autonomy to its African colonies, including in its colony in Upper Volta. In 1960, Upper Volta became independent, with Maurice Yamilgo becoming the country's first president. However, Yamilgo was not looked at, even in his early days, as a hero to the people of Upper Volta. He was hated by essentially every notable political force in the country, and is almost a textbook example of how to get yourself overthrown. He insulted the Catholic Church and Muslim imams. He cut back on social programs, angering trade unions. He cut bureaucrat salaries. He reduced the influence of traditional chiefs and he banned every party that wasn't his own. So the opposition, and everyone else that might be interested in politics in the country, hated him. Corruption and disease also didn't really help his image. In 1966, the unions went on strike, and he was forced to step down, and the military took power. This new military government, however, also failed to improve the country. Drought and desertification hurt more and more farmers, and the country remained very poor, and elections weren't until 1978. A coup in 1980 brought a new military government, this one was again disliked by labor unions and the left, and was quickly overthrown in 1982. This new military-dominated government, again, was not long for this world, and another coup took place in 1983, bringing about yet another military government. However, this government was different from the others. It was led by a young military captain, Thomas Sankara. Now, if there's anything you know about Burkinian history, it's almost certainly Thomas Sankara. Sankara is often called the Che Guevara of Africa due to Sankara promoting radical left-wing and anti-colonial ideas. He was strongly opposed to foreign aid, believing that foreign aid was just used by colonial powers to control weaker countries, and Sankara promoted food self-sufficiency. He sought to give women greater equality, banning forced marriage, and giving women more autonomy over their sex, private, and professional life. He also sought to vaccinate his population against deadly diseases, with over 2 million being vaccinated. He sought to prevent increased desertification in his country, and promoted African pride. As a part of this desire for greater pride in his people, he renamed the country to Burkina Faso. Burkina means, depending on the translation you use, upright people, honest people, or uncorruptible people in Moray, and Faso means land in Dulia. While many changes Sankara made were undoubtedly loved by many in his country, he did also make enemies. His hostility towards Western powers, which he labeled as imperialist and exploitive, created friction between Burkina Faso and France and America. These countries, along with the opposition, accused Sankara of corruption, 
suppression of dissent, and using unfair political tribunals to arrest his opponents. In 1985, Mali and Burkina Faso went to war over disputed border territory, which led to Mali to take several towns along the border, which created dissatisfaction with the military. In 1987, military leaders with aid, allegedly, from rival African states in France, overthrew Sankara and killed him. Before we talk about the new regime that took Sankara's place, I do just want to note that Sankara is a very, very popular political figure, not just in LARPing leftist spaces, but also in the country itself. At the very least, it's clear that many in the country, particularly in the cultural field, admire the way Sankara encouraged pride for the people of Burkina Faso. And you can see many people, even after the coup, were inspired by his patriotic and revolutionary mindset. Art depicting him can be found throughout the country, and several political outfits claim to uphold his legacy. This new government was initially led by three military officers, until 1989, when Blaise Compaoré accused the others of plotting to overthrow the government. Kampare was at first an ally of Sankara, helping Sankara take power and serving as a trusted advisor. He took part in the 87 coup, claiming that he never intended to kill Sankara, but I get the sense a lot of people don't really buy that. The point is, Kampare should have on paper led a government relatively similar to Sankara, given his background. But Kampare ended up reversing a lot of the policies Sankara had enacted. He sought to improve relations with Western powers and the many African states around Burkina Faso. He gave greater autonomy to local political elites, which helped them maintain a powerful support base. He stopped trying to promote food self-sufficiency, and the country abandoned its positioning as a revolutionary state. The only thing Kampare seemed to keep was the name of the country. Well, actually, you can argue that Kampare also kept the more authoritarian attitude towards the opposition. Kampare and his party, the Congress for Democracy and Progress, dominated the country, controlling most political offices and winning every election in the country starting in 1997, with Kampare getting re-elected into office with over 80% of the vote. Admittedly, half the time he got so high of a vote because all the opposition parties decided to boycott, but hey, I'm sure that didn't stop him from bragging about it with his allies. Opponents of Kampare could also expect to be jailed, and any rallies that oppose Kampare could expect to be beaten back with a violent response from the police. Despite this, several different opposition groups emerged in the country, opposing Kampare. Some of these groups were those who wished the country to go back to the days of Thomas Sankara. Some wanted just greater social programs and adopted a center-left course. Others fought for a liberal democracy, and small groups of Muslims in rural areas even advocated for an Islamist state, inspired by Islamist forces that were operating in Algeria. Protests would pop up from time to time, with large protests in 2011, caused by the rising cost of living and repression by the state security forces. However, Kampare would continue to remain in charge. This would change in October of 2014. Kampare had made a speech where he seemed to suggest that he was going to amend the constitution, to let him continue to run the country after his current term was up. This, along with generally poor economic conditions, led many in the country, and particularly in the capital, to begin protesting in the streets. After only three days, which saw massive riots that even burned down the country's parliament building, Kampare fled the country. His 27-year-long rule was ended and an interim government was set up. But it wasn't smooth sailing for the interim government. In September of 2015, members of the RSP military unit staged a coup, attempting to overthrow the interim government. However, this coup attempt was only able to exert control in Ouagadougou, and suffered from massive protests against it. Ultimately, this coup attempt would fail, and the interim government would retake charge. Elections would be held in November, that elected Rock Mark Christian Kabore, a former prime minister. One of the biggest hurdles Kabore would have to deal with would be the growing number of Islamist groups operating in the country. North Africa was largely destabilized after both the overthrow of Gaddafi in Libya, the rebellion in northern Mali, and the continued violence from the Algerian civil war. All this allowed radical Islamists greater ease in expanding their operations across northwest Africa who began arguing against traditional social structures in the rural parts of the country, which appealed to many of the disadvantaged groups in society. Terror attacks began in late 2015, and have since then been an unfortunately common experience, despite the efforts of the Burkinabe army and Western advisors sent in to try and prevent the spread of radical Islam. One of the bloodiest terror attacks would occur in mid-2021, when over 170 people were killed in the towns of Solha and Taudiat, in a series of shootings and massacres. The failure of the government to stop the violence led to resentment among some in the country, and especially in the army. Very recently, in late January of 2022, the army led by Lieutenant Colonel Paul Henry Sandago Demiba overthrew Kambore in a coup. Demiba is currently leading an interim government, 
and is promising to hold an election after a three-year transitional period, but I wouldn't be surprised if this new government decides for whatever reason to extend their mandate on power. It seems there is some support in the country for this new government, but internationally it has mostly been condemned by the UN and the AU. This new interim government is likely going to attempt but struggle to deal with the many problems facing the country today. It is one of the poorest countries in the world and has a very low GDP and HDI score. Economically, it is still reliant off of cotton and gold, which are important industries but bring a relatively small amount of wealth into the country. Food insecurity and poverty is common, desertification is increasing in the north, terror attacks continue to happen across the country, with the most recent one occurring on April 8th, with an army base being attacked, and corruption is still very rampant in the country. So why does Burkina Faso exist? One common thread throughout Burkinian history is resistance. The Mosi resisted against the large empires in the north, the people resisted against French rule in the 1810s, which created the French colony that would eventually become the independent state of Burkina Faso, after protests in the 40s and 50s. Protests led to the fall of Yamago and Kampore, and Saqqara based his government off of resisting imperialist forces. The people of Burkina Faso are not willing to let someone else decide their fate for them, and are willing to fight for what they believe in. This determination to remain in charge of their own destiny is what has led the country to where it is today. Up next, we stay in Africa and go to Burundi. Prepare for the last B country so far, waiting for Bougainville to become independent in 10 years, the Belgians, and a reverse Rwandan genocide. So thanks for listening, thanks for watching, and take care. So after this, I'll work on the Filipino Parties episode, which should be out before the 9th. I want to get it out before then, just so um, I can get it before the presidential election. And then after that, I'll do Colombian political parties, which will probably be out sooner than this, but I want it to be out by at least the 29th of May, just because that is the Colombian presidential election. And then after that, I'll do the history of Burundi. So yeah, thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed. If you want, you can email me at why do countries exist for your thoughts, comments, suggestions, or hate mail. Take care. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. So the sources I use are Afro Marxist's documentary on Thomas Sankara, Al Jazeera's report, What's Behind Burkina Faso's Latest Coup Attempt, Caspian Report's videos, French Military Operations in Africa, and How France Maintains Its Grip on Africa, Culture of Resistance Films documentary, Burkinabe Uprising, El Paso's article, and this is in Spanish, so forgive me, Moro Naba Mucho Mas Que Un Rey, Geography Now's video on Burkina Faso, The Global Africans Report, Popular Democracy in Burkina Faso, Global Security's article on the ethnic groups in Burkina Faso, the Guardian article, Burkina Faso's Capital Erupts in Protest, Home Team History's video on the Mosi people, International Crisis Group reports the social roots of jihadist violence in Burkina Faso's north, Wendyam Hervé Lancode report, uh, reports, Burkina Faso Rocky Road to Democratic Consolidation, Mr. History's video, A Super Quick History of Burkina Faso, Newsreel's page on the film Thomas Sankara, The Upright Man, Vice News documentary, The Fall of Kampara, and Wikipedia.